the sort of grave um, impacts that COVID-19 as well as measures taken to mitigate its spread have had on the continent. This second one focuses on what we're seeing in terms of homegrown solutions for the social economic transformation of Africa in the post COVID-19 recovery. <clears throat> we're, this being Mandela Day, I believe we're going to open with a very short sort of inspirational video uh, to remind us about um, the kinds of sort of histories that we've had in terms of taking our destiny into our own hands, which really is the ethos that lies behind this series. So I'll turn to our um, logistics IT people who are gonna play us this video. The happiness of a human being must ordinary people of our world really to determine their destiny unhindered by tyrants and dictators is at the very heart of the reason for the existence of this organization. The great challenge of our age to the United Nations organization is to answer the question, given the interdependence of the nations of the world, what is it that we can and must do to ensure that democracy, peace, and prosperity prevail everywhere? Our common humanity and the agency of the knock on the door of this great edifice demand that we must attempt even the impossible. Thank you so very much. Um, I'll turn to Ahuna Azia Konwa, who, as everyone knows, is the director of UNDP's Regional Bureau for Africa, and one of the leaders and conveners of the Levi Group, just to give us some welcoming remarks. Uh, Ahuna? Thank you, Mudoni, and let me wish all of you a good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever in the world you are. And happy Mandela Day. Um, many will be wondering why we're doing this today on a Saturday. It is Mandela Day. And uh, we celebrate this year with some sadness, um, with the remembering, uh, remembering today Mandela's daughter, Zinzi Mandela, who passed away uh, recently. And we really want to join this uh, her family and the, the, the entire uh, population of South Africa in uh, remembering her and sending condolences uh, to, to the family and may her soul rest in peace. She was a woman of substance, a certain woman, an activist in her own rights. And today we mourn her even as we celebrate uh, the incredible life that her father Lived, that she lived. Today, we celebrate the life of a global icon, an outstanding world leader, a global statesman. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who is right now delivering the 18th annual Nelson Mandela Lecture, called Mandela a moral giant of the 20th century. He speaks today on the theme tackling inequality pandemics, a new social contract for a new era. It is no accident, therefore, that the Leadership and Values Initiative brings us together today to examine how the spirit of Ubuntu that Mandiba embodied is yielding homegrown solutions to the inequality and, and other pandemics that are facing Africa and the world. Madiba was many things, but above all, he was an African 
homegrown, born and bred by African families. So Africa should cherish this moment, a moment of pride in having given birth to a man who today symbolizes human greatness. He was a son of the African soil. Today, more than ever, we miss you, Madiba. As the world is brought to its knees by coronavirus, it is a world that needs to be reminded of your wisdom, of your kindness, of your integrity, of your Ubuntu. The question we ask today is whether the world can look to Africa for solutions to the global pandemic of inequality, poverty, injustice, destruction of our environment, sexual exploitation, violence against women and girls, racial discrimination, and the list goes on. Is it time for us, all of us, leaders and led, to embrace that concept, concept of Ubuntu, of leadership infused by this concept? a new social contract with an Ubuntu identity. The main modern proponent of this concept, of this philosophy, is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, he describes a person with Ubuntu as, and I quote, open and available to others, affirming of others, has proper self-assurance, end of quote. Imagine a world where this is the reality. It will be a different world. The homegrown solutions we seek today are not only to help us defeat inequality and poverty and climate change in Africa, but also to contribute to the global search for enduring solutions to these global pandemics. COVID-19 has revealed the deep poverty of our civilization, North and South, East and West. As such, we need global solidarity that leaves no one behind. The type of solidarity reflected in the 2030 Agenda and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Just check it out. It's actually all in there. At the leadership and ethics and values initiative, public goods and resource, resources group, which is what we are, those who are putting this together, we believe that we are on the cusp of a new Africa and a new world, that there is a real possibility to construct a new normal, a new way, because normal is what was wrong. A way where people are the center of all of our activities, rooted in their dignity and their prosperity. We come together today as part of this Leadership with Values Initiative a product of the World Economic Forum Africa Regional Strategy. It is a movement that is galvanizing people capital to entrench a values and principles based culture for leadership in Africa. In the Public Goods and Resources Working Group, which I have the privilege to co facilitate with Brian Kagoro, who is here with us today, my colleagues and I are seized with advocating for a type of leadership that prioritizes investments in public goods and services, that Africa's resources also work for Africa's people and African development. We are advancing a new leadership contract, leadership with Ubuntu. What are the leadership choices needed to reset Africa's development button? What direction should Africa take? What fundamentals need to shift? Must we tinker with the known? Or is there a new way? Can we imagine an Africa where Africa's trade, industry, investment, and natural resources 
finance Africa's socioeconomic transformation. We wrestle with these questions today and ask ourselves what it means for each and every one of us individually. It will take courage. It will take determination. But as Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man, and I would add all women, is not he or she who does not feel afraid, but he or she who conquers that fear. Let us take courage. Let us defeat fear. Let us take those bold actions that work to ensure Africa's promise becomes a reality of our time. It's such a pleasure to be part of this group and to have a platform where we can harness the solutions that are being born out of the continent and that could have utility beyond Africa. I am now very pleased to hand back to Dr. Modoni Mayeki, our moderator for today's dialogue and wish all of us vibrant uh, deliberations. Over back to you, Modoni. Thank you so much for that opening and welcome, which begins to set the scene for us. Um, before I start introducing our amazing and quite diverse panel. Um, we have a video message from Amina Mohammed, who's, uh, as again, as everyone knows, the Deputy Secretary General of the UN. She's a Nigerian British diplomat and politician um, who was previously Nigeria's Minister of uh, Environment. Uh, she was a key player in the post-2015 development agenda process and later acted as senior special assistant to Nigeria's president on the Millennium Development Goals. Um, so we have a message um, from her by way of video. Thank you for the opportunity to join this dialogue, spotlighting the critical importance of Africa's homegrown solutions in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic and in building back better. The pandemic is deepening inequalities with Africa's poorest bearing the brunt. As a result of the COVID-19, 23 million people in sub-Saharan Africa may be pushed into extreme poverty in 2020, and many countries on the continent could suffer food crises. Africa has approached these challenges head on, drawing on successes gained both before and since the outbreak of COVID-19. Africa's commitment to complementary implementation of the 2030 Agenda and its own Agenda 2063 have been guiding factors. African countries have been recognized multiple times by the United Nations for developing homegrown innovative public services in delivering the SDGs. Over the past few months, Africa has also witnessed inspiring homegrown ICT solutions to the pandemic. 20 African countries have recently shared with the UN Secretariat 50 such innovative responses to COVID-19. These cover e-health, e-services, supply chains, e-participation, and social inclusion, e-business, e-commerce, and e-learning. These solutions all go well for advancing Africa's science, technology, and innovation in the post-COVID era. Promoting local and social entrepreneurship, especially by women and young people, will nurture innovations that will pave the way for socioeconomic change, accelerating progress towards the SDGs. In Kenya, Personal protective equipment has been locally manufactured for use by the country and its neighbors, ensuring consistent supply of this much needed product. And in Rwanda, the Rwanda Chamber of Women's Entrepreneurs set up clinics to provide business advisory services, mentorship, and coaching to women-led businesses to help them in the recovery process in fighting the pandemic. Africa is using her most precious resource, her young people, to undertake contact tracing, staff isolation centers, and provide supportive care. Young people in Niger are contributing in the fight against COVID-19 through a web platform that helps collect data, share concerns, and communicate COVID-19 alerts in poor communities. To tap Africa's vast innovation potential and embrace its indigenous knowledge and local technology, we must, however, further improve the continent's enabling frameworks. 
First, we must see more transformative leadership in action. Leadership across the public sector, the scientific and technical communities, and the businesses and the education sectors. I applaud the organizers for drawing attention to the need for changing the mindset of leaders. Indeed, the 2030 Agenda calls for leadership that is open to reform, to participation, to integration and to accountability. Africa's drive for homegrown solutions must be guided by African leaders who are ready to embrace transformation. We must also reinforce policy frameworks and effective institutions already in place that encourage, recognize and reward homegrown solutions. Renewed efforts must be made to enhance transparency and accountability in budgeting and resource allocation. Another vital element in this critical endeavor is investment. The crisis offers an opportunity to reallocate public resources through broad-based fiscal stimulus measures, targeting investments in universal health care, education, social protection, and in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. It offers an opportunity for increased investment in trade to grow the African continental free trade area and markets for Africa's homegrown products. And Africa needs investment in infrastructure, including in digital infrastructure, to bridge widening digital divides. The United Nations stands ready to support through our strength and country teams and through our enhanced international partnership and South-South cooperation. The Secretary General and I will work with the UN family to provide concrete support to Africans' homegrown solutions to contribute to the realization of the aspirations of both the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063. I wish you a really fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that message. Um, so there you have it from Ahuna and Amina. Really, the idea of this series is to look at what African resources, knowledge, capacities, institutions are already coming together to innovate around policy, around financing, around production and supply, and really try and use the recovery that will come that will have to come to use a cliche to build back better, to build back in a sort of transformative way, including through what we've now all seen as being the imperative to invest in African innovations and African research and development. Um, Amina already spoke about the list of some of the innovations that we've already seen by young Africans in terms of addressing the health needs um, that are still yet to fully uh, the scale of which is still yet to be fully realized as we expect the peak in sort of August, September. This session, though, is focusing on sort of economic innovations. We all know at the Pan-African level what the AU has done in terms of uh, taking uh, leadership, its appointment of, its setting up of the fund, its appointment of the envoys, the call for the debt standstill, the work now on using, on getting special drawing rights and setting up a special purpose vehicle to invest in social economic um, transformation to be able to have the fiscal space to do so. At the national level, we've seen all sorts of um, critical ambulance measures in terms of supporting our SMEs, in terms of scaling up social assistance, as well as the national funds. And it's really from civil society and the private sector that we've seen the a massive amount of energy that's been unleashed in terms of really scaling up informal social protection in the form of assistance, in terms of ensuring local food supply and market, local food supply chains and markets remain open and production continues. The renewed calls for universal healthcare for the experiments that we're seeing in a couple of places on um, moving from social assistance to a universal basic income. But we've also seen new energy around calls for social policy to address in inequality, um, for real funding to go into education and health, um, that all of these sort of efforts at reform of our social insurance system, reform of our social protection systems, build uh, are part of the building back better. We've seen also groups coming together around how do we make use of this new sort of boom in local manufacturing um, in the areas of agriculture and energy to ensure that the recovery is transformative and that we see a green transition in the recovery. 
we see the calls for regional integration um, and really this epidemic has given a credence to the and uh, imperatives, I guess, to the necessity of realizing our African continental free trade area. And we've seen two calls around how to finance all of this. So of course, at the AU level, they're working on the debt standstill issue. But internally, most many actors are working on domestic resource mobilization, on tax justice, on bringing back to the table the question of dealing with Ill illicit financial flows. We have a very skilled panel to discuss all of these ideas today, and I will introduce them now uh, in alphabetical order. Not that we're putting men before women, um, but starting with Wam Kalemene, who's our new Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. He was elected to this position, uh, having come from being Chief Director Africa Economic Relations at the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa. Prior to assuming this position, he was Director of International Trade Law and Investment Law, again at the Department of Trade and Industry, where he was Principal Legal Counsel on International Trade Law and International Investment Law. Welcome, Wam Kelle. We also have uh, Kojo Paris, who's a retired banker, social entrepreneur, and academic, who has merged his social entrepreneurship and impact investing experience in diplomacy, um, focusing on social entrepreneurship and statecraft, developing social value metrics, institutionalizing mentorship for small and medium-sized enterprises, and in these days of lockdown, apparently orchestrating the perfect unbaked cheesecake. He chairs Levi's small and medium-sized enterprise support work group. We then have Didi Nunwele, Nunelli, sorry, um, who is the co-founder of Sahel Consulting and works as its managing partner. She has 25 years of experience in entry national development and through her work with Sahel has shaped agriculture strategy and policy and launched innovative businesses and ecosystem solutions in partnerships with clients in the public, private and nonprofit sectors. She's the co-founder of AACE Foods, uh, which she was just telling us is still operating, um, manufacturing, uh, chair of nourishingafrica.com and founder of Leap Africa. And last but certainly not least, we have Bridget Motsepe Radebe, who I'm sure most people know her, who is a South African businesswoman in the mining industry. She started Macau Mining, uh, a mining firm which incubates, initiates explorations and produces platinum, gold, and chrome. She's the president of the South African Mining Development Association and received an International Business Person of the Year Award from the Global Foundation for Democracy. Welcome, all four of you. And to get us going, um, as I warned you, I, would, I, I was going to ask you all one question. What is the biggest social, socioeconomic challenge that you are concerned about or have been concerned about over these past three months? And what's the most exciting innovation that you've seen addressing this challenge um, in the months that lie that we've just been through? Wamkela, I'll start with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I want to thank uh, Madam Ezia Konwa for um, her remarks, uh, the Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General rather, for her remarks also. Um, I think that um, uh, convening this event today um, on uh, the remembrance of President Mandela's contribution to humanity is absolutely appropriate. And we all know that President Mandela was a strong supporter of multilateralism, a very strong multilateralist. And so I think it's appropriate that uh, UNDP is, um, is hosting this event. What we've seen in the last three months is um, a, um, uh, a, a weak Africa's weakness in industrial development has been exposed by the crisis. Uh, we've seen um, that Africa's over-reliance on supply chains that take us elsewhere 
um, Africa's over-reliance on global value chains um, has exposed a key weakness. And that is that when there is a global disruption of this nature that is unprecedented, quite frankly, um, Africa suffers probably more than any other continent um, in the world. And so what we have been thinking about is this challenge. It is, it is uh, of course, it is um, uh, uh, made worse. It is exacerbated by, by, by the crisis, but this deficit in industrial development um, has got to be confronted head on. And so this crisis is an opportunity for us as Africans to reconfigure uh, our supply chains, to relook at how we can establish manufacturing, industrial development centers of excellence across the African continent, um, looking in particular at uh, areas that are labor intensive so that young Africans can have jobs and looking at areas uh, in industrial development, investing in productive capacity in areas that are critical for uh, public health in Africa, uh, not only for this pandemic, but going forward um, so that we're able to, through industrial development, through industrialization in Africa and the establishment of value chains that we are able to confront um, not only this pandemic, as I say, but future pandemics um, as we go forward. The second uh, challenge that this has uh, exposed is in the area of intellectual property rights. I think we've got to ask ourselves, how is Africa's intellectual property rights regime, how does it service um, Africa's manufacturing capacity to manufacture uh, uh, generic drugs? How does it facilitate Africa's um, uh, patents, uh, access to public health, um, and ensuring that our patents regime is once again at the service of um, Africa's public health uh, uh, imperatives. To me, these are the, the, core, uh, the core challenges that have been brought to the fore by COVID-19 and how we respond uh, in the medium to long term really is critical to, um, to Africa's uh, uh, survival in future pandemics, because we know, we know that when, uh, where these uh, personal protection equipment or all of this other equipment that is required to fight the pandemic, we, know, we now were faced a few months ago with a situation where um, uh, the global market for these essential goods um, was actually distorted. Um, against uh, Africa because countries were not exporting them, they were imposing export restrictions and therefore distorting the global market um, for these very, very critical and essential goods to fight the pandemic. And so Africa has got to be in a position uh, from an industrial development point of view, must be in a position to respond to that sort of a challenge. And the African continental free trade area provides us with an opportunity to enhance um, Africa's industrial development uh, objectives in, in the long term. So thank you. Thank you so much. So the biggest challenge being our weak industrial uh, development, reliance on external supply chains, distortion of global markets. You forgot to tell us the innovation that has most excited you, but you can come back to that. Uh, in a bit, I'm going to turn to Kojo and ask you the same question. What's most concerned you on the socioeconomic front and what has most excited you in terms of how you've seen Africans responding? You're on mute, you're on mute. Hi, thanks a lot, Matoni, and really great to be here with, with all the other really amazing panelists. And, and to, to really have heard Nelson Mandela once again stirs a, a certain sense of, of, of need for, for leadership across the continent. And, you know, in, in, we, we hear a narrative around Africa as being, you know, we're, we're unprepared. Melinda Gates said we were going to have bodies in the streets as, uh, um, as a consequence of COVID. But can I say that I'm actually quite excited and really happy as to how African leadership, particularly the state in many places, have responded in Senegal, in 
in, in Nigeria, even here in South Africa. Um, given the challenges we've had in the last few years, there are all sorts of stories of how things were going to get entirely out of whack and, and, and the systems are going to crash. We have problems and, and we have huge problems, but I'd like to highlight a couple of amazing successes which are taking place even as we speak. On the 1st of September, um, a, a social enterprise that I'm associated with called Pila Hatley will launch a pilot which will affect over impact positively over the next three to five years the public health status of over 20 million South Africans. What it will do is ensure that over that period of time that some of these key comorbidities which, which, which have wreaked havoc on our communities will be positively addressed. Hypertension, diabetes, BMI, stroke, obesities. And it will do this using a framework which for many of us is commonly available, those of us in South Africa and even beyond who have access to discovery and, and similar medical insurance. We have a vitality program which tells us how to eat properly, how to exercise, and how to do, how to do lots of self-care. Well, this social enterprise will do this for 20 million South Africans. And you know what the amazing thing is, Mathoni, is when we approached the government of South Africa, and particularly the Department of Social Development, they have been enthusiastic partners and they've been pushing us to get this program going. So yes, we have lots of challenges in Africa, but what we have seen is that there have been points of excellence in the response from African leadership. And we have to recognize, celebrate, and replicate these throughout Africa. And that's precisely what um, Pila Hatle will do. It's led by a young black South African woman, Gugu Maisele, and she's taking time off from her career as a high-flying accountant, et cetera, to drive these programs. And then there's Chikoni, and forgive me, but it's probably not the right pronunciation. Um, and it means, it's, a, it's in the vendor language, and it means fountain of information, um, so, something similar to that, community inf information. And what Chikoni is doing, it will, it will transform, repurpose a network of, of libraries across South Africa. South Africa has 16, 1,600 libraries. And over the years, they've become underutilized because it's not fashionable anymore to use libraries, um, pen and paper and things like those. But a young architect who's, who was on his way to, to Canada because he, he couldn't, uh, couldn't forge a career in South Africa, Edward Toller Marsh, has seen the opportunity to repurpose these libraries and turn them into centers of community information. Now, you, you know, all of us would have heard of WeWork and, and these um, shared office spaces. Those are no longer possible because of, of COVID. However, your neighborhood library can be repurposed. So smaller groups of people can meet. If you're an SMME and you'd like a working space, if you're a student, I mean, I have an 18 year old here who is very upset because she can't go to university campus and hang out, but she and her friends can go to a neighborhood library and study, okay? And within, and the whole idea of Sishikoni will be to recreate that sense of neighborliness, that sense of community. And so this repurposing, again, there's no reason why we can't replicate this across the continent. And a third example I'd like to, to, to draw, draw, draw to you is, a really beautiful one. One of the really terrible things COVID has done, and we see it driving around the streets, is the increase in homelessness. And, and, and a part of that increase in homelessness is that people can't fend for themselves in, in the main. And, and the level of hunger has increased enormously. Well, you know, I have a good friend in, in, in Zim called um, Niamudzai Garway. And Niamudzai has always been telling us about the greening of urban areas and how important it is. And I consulted a, a, a mentee of mine, Simon, who does a lot of garden, um, urban gardens. And Simon has come up with a great plan, which is being rolled out now, to transform parks, 10, 5 to 10% of urban parks in, in Joburg, if transformed, over the next five years, can feed every homeless person in this town. You know, we have 22,000 we estimate 22,000 homeless people in South Africa, in, a, <clears throat> in Johannesburg, and 22,000 hectares. 
So five to 10% of those. And if we were to grow, um, Simon has done his estimates on growing avocados, pecan nuts, and citruses. And in five years from now, if it's done correctly, each homeless person in, in, in Johannesburg every day will be able to eat one avocado, three oranges, and 150 grams of pecan nuts. Now that's a lot healthier than I eat every day, Muthoni. But these are just very, very specific things which are happening now as a result of, but will endure beyond COVID and help to create healthier societies, societies which are more internally self-sufficient. So yes, Africa has loads of problems. We have lots of structural problems and Brian and I speak about them. We have weak institutions, we have unpatriotic leadership, we, you know, we have fiscal situations which are out of whack, but there are positive things happening and we want to celebrate these and replicate these across the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So one innovation dealing with um, underlying health conditions and sort of social conditions of um, social determinants of health, um, one dealing with how to recreate community in a socially distanced society and create spaces for young people to work, to study, come together, and one to deal with urban food issues. And speaking of food, we come to Didi. Um, what has most concerned you and what has most excited you? Thank you very much. And thanks to all the previous speakers for your wonderful remarks. So I am based in Lagos, Nigeria and have been working in the food ecosystem for the last 12 years. And as you can imagine, when COVID hit, my biggest concern was the food crisis. At that time, everybody was still focused on the health crisis and sadly, my fears have materialized. What we've seen with lockdowns, coupled with the locust problems in East Africa, is that the entire continent is facing a looming food crisis. The World Food Program estimates that the number of food insecure will double uh, before the end of the year. And this is not unique to Africa, but what is exposed is the fragility of our food ecosystem, which unfortunately is highly fragmented with high rates of post-harvest losses, low productivity, and limited coordination between actors. Now with the lockdowns, what happened also was that our farmers couldn't access inputs. And in the West African region, it's planting season at the moment. There were slowdowns, uh, lockdowns, which prevented farmers from accessing markets. And with most restaurants and hotels locked down, that also created a lot of challenges. So food prices have increased in Nigeria from 10% to 100%, depending on the food that you consume. And that is, this is leading to increased hunger, malnutrition, especially for the most vulnerable, the children and the elderly. Now, what are we doing about it? And what excites me is that in spite of this crisis and all the predictions, for the first time, we're seeing unusual actors come together. I'm part of one group that's basically just focused on data because we realize that we have to feed the most vulnerable and we have to feed them quickly. Where are they? How can we find them? We're seeing community groups, faith-based organizations, private companies and public organizations coming together. And I'm chairing this zero hunger data group with the WFP and the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and people are starting to share data. We're seeing young people come up with web-based platforms similar to the one that I mean, I, Mohammed talked about, um, and in, in our context, it's called beatingcorona.ng, corona which is compiling all the great work that our community and faith-based organizations and our individuals are doing to feed people and basically matching those programs to where they're needed the most. And then we're also seeing great innovations. Companies are pivoting quickly. And in COVID, I created an organization called nourishingafrica.com. And it's envisaged as a platform for a million entrepreneurs who drive the transformation of the agriculture and food landscape in Africa. And nourishingafrica.com is now live and we have about 500 entrepreneurs who are actively engaged and thousands more who use the resources. And what does it offer? It offers information on financing and pivoting your business, uh, links to support networks and knowledge 
basis. And we started something called Ask an Expert because obviously a lot of our entrepreneurs are having to pivot. 50% of them had to shut down temporarily and their fears that it might never reopen. And the other 50% are experiencing a boom in their business because they're leveraging innovation and technology. And so we're galvanizing all of these groups to share information across the continent. Entrepreneurs in Kenya are interfacing with entrepreneurs in Nigeria. And what COVID-19 has done is broken down the barriers that existed because all of us are on technology and realizing that we can actually work effectively leveraging technology. And so Nourishing Africa has just blown our minds when it comes to what can be done. And I think this is the time for us. Of course, you said it was cliche to build back better, but to recognize that we have to build more resilient food ecosystems. And that will take a number of things. Number one, it will take the data that I talked about. We need data. We need every country needs to understand its, its balance scorecard when it comes to food, where there are excesses and where there are uh, shortages and leveraging all the networks we have ensure that we have more trade in our food ecosystem, but also ensure that we can improve productivity and channel resources where they're required. Beyond data, we need shorter value chains. And I'm starting to see with the lockdowns that a lot of countries are starting to source locally and to recognize the importance of sourcing locally. And that's opening up a whole ecosystem. I'm the co-founder of a food company. And in the last two months, we've seen tremendous demand for our spices and complementary foods in Nigeria, where multinationals who used to import the spices they use are now coming to us to say, can we buy from you? And we need to enshrine this in our policies. We need to have 30 to 60% local sourcing policies requiring companies to source locally where they can, because this will unlock our value chains and reduce our dependency on the rest of the world and force us to innovate. And beyond local value chains, we also need collaboration. And this collaboration is critical and has to be emphasized because when we think about the food ecosystem, it's not just the Ministry of Agriculture, it's the Ministry of Trade and Investment, it's every single ministry that's involved in food. Food is medicine, so even the ministries of health. And so we need to break down the walls around food and ensure cross-sector collaboration and create almost food think tanks in our countries, leveraging all the research institutions and the universities. I'm convinced that we will emerge stronger. At least our food ecosystem will emerge stronger because this shock is just an example of future shocks to come. And we realize that we have to take advantage of this sector. Africa is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. And I'm looking forward to engaging with more of you to see how we can ensure that we can feed ourselves and nourish the world post COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> That's amazing. Um, common platforms and where food is and where where it's needed. Um, collaboration across the continent. Um, last but not least, um, we have, I can see 174 participants and questions and chats are coming. Um, but Bridget, what in your world um, has seemed um, most of a sort of socioeconomic challenge and what has most excited you around how Africans are responding? Um, good afternoon. And um, it's just a day after we buried Zinzi Mandela. And I want to dedicate this today in the future to the Mandela legacy. Um, I was the first black person to produce, produce minerals in South Africa 30 years ago. And as a woman, there were laws that said black and white women could not go underground because it was a, a, a law that was inherited from the industrial revolution where in the coal mines, the women and children were used as cheap labor and that regarded to uh, uh, labor abuse and that continued to prevail. And of course, right now we don't have those laws. So I had to defy legislation, but what was unique during that time was that it was during the racist regime, President Mandela, was still in jail in Robben Island. And uh, Uncle Oliver Tambo, he was in exile. And many of our leaders in South Africa were just pursuing the day-to-day -day, uh, fight against racism and oppression. Our basic human rights, food, clothing, and shelter was denied. And our social, political, and economic emancipation of the majority of the people was denied. However, what prevailed during that time was because of the sanctions. And because of the fact that South Africa was guided and protected against 
interaction with the rest of the world for various reasons. We, we, we were happy about the sanctions because that resulted to the death of the apartheid and racist regime and the, 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 the emergence of our new South Africa when in 1994, we voted black people were allowed to vote for the first time in their lives in South Africa. Mandela becoming the president. However, what was unique during that time is because of the borders being closed and the world not wanting to integrate on economic and manufacturing capacity with South Africa. South Africa's industries internally were very uniquely endowed and developed. We had the textile industry, we had the, the, the manufacturing industry, very, very potently strong. And the mining industry was also quite strong, uh, leading producers of minerals and all that. However, we were not allowed to integrate and interact. How, and then the sanctions were then lifted and then we, we then became 1994, uh, uh, we started embracing uh, the participation into action with the rest of the world. And what happened? Our industries were then threatened by the, the potential, threatened, but at the same time benefited. But the threat is, instead of continuing with the beneficiation that we had done be, before, the beneficiation and, and, and the manufacturing of products, in South Africa took secondary to that of the in entry of the Chinese and the Indians and other countries. And when you look at Africa, you find that we are the leading producers of minerals. And as the leading producers of minerals in the African continent, uh, in the world, we don't even produce the end product. You know, you find that 55% of the cobalt is produced in, in uh, is, 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 is extracted. From, from, from the DRC. And the cobalt helps with the smartphones, it helps with the batteries, it helps with also the planes. And that many fact that, 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 but we import all that. We're not even having factories at midnight. Iron ore, manganese, steel manufacturing commodities. We should be creating the planes, the cars and everything in the continent. And we're not doing that. And what we tried to do as South Africa and the new South Africa, we looked at the, 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 the laws that we inherited, and we then realized what are the laws that we have to change in terms of making sure that the industrialization and the, and the, and the development of our economy can be enhanced. And there's a very unique law that helps with that. And the law, I mean, and I'll go through it as we go along because I've got seven minutes to say this thing. But within the laws, you find that no company can buy a mineral from South Africa and manufacture offshore without getting permission from our minister. And that's section 26 of the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act that I'll go through it later. But then there's also something, I go to the World Economic Forum and I see that the third and fourth industrial revolution is king. Now, when we look at the manufacturing, are we now going to create robotics and, 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 and then compromise the, the, the hands and the manufacturing. And what I normally say when I sit in those workshops, I always stand up and you find that the emerging economies and the, the countries that are underdeveloped would say, okay, we like the, the uh, idea that we're going to have robotics and we have to, we're going to have the, 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 the fourth industrial revolution, but we must also adopt and adapt to suit our local challenges because we cannot 100% replace the machines with the workers in the rural area or in an emerging economy where people still have people, um, lots of people without that benefit. And then I sit on in NETLEC. NETLEC is the National Economic Development and Labor Council of South Africa, where all the business chamber leaders, I'm the chairperson of the Black Business Council, we've got the federation, we've got 61 chambers under us. So the Black Leadership, Business Leadership South Africa, Business Leadership South Africa, Black Business Council, the, 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 the Labor Federation, the union and, and, and that are part of the unions and government economic cluster ministers would sit in that lab. And we look at COVID-19 and we look at how it has actually created an industry where people and can now go and, uh, and, and manufacture personal protect, protective uh, 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 products and items, which we never had. But then I also look at uh, the, 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 the kind of fact that we, we closed down and with the lockdown, it gave us our country the opportunity to look at who we are, 
where we come from and what it is that we have to do. And the benefits of the lockdown is, and the benefits of COVID-19 is that it's giving us a wake up call to make sure that within the Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement, we can then open up and integrate so that we do not just have a, a, a mining industry that's not integrated with the rest of Africa. And we do also have a, a health industry that's not integrated and the partnership and the, and the, and, and, and the, the dual working relationship in an integrated program must be enhanced. So where to from now? I'm also been, uh, nominated as ambassador of the Pan-African Parliament for Economic Development and Entrepreneurship for Women in Africa. What we need to do and is make sure that we use the African Union and look at the African Union and look at how the transfer pricing and the listed output of capital is prohibiting countries from getting taxation. I'm the one that went to parliament and went to the portfolio committee of the Department of Trade and Industry, Finance and Mining to say, we are not paying tax. The we is meaning the companies that mainly have a primary listing offshore are not paying tax. To date in COVID-19, if our countries in Africa had taxation payment, those countries would have had money to be able to invest in road infrastructure, in electricity, food security, health, especially health. The clinics and the hospitals are not there because government is not getting tax to make sure that government invests in those products. And fortunately, from my, in, from my input in parliament, the Judge Dennis Davis Commission was then created by the Minister of Finance at that time, and, and, and then commission is investigating that. But President uh, Mbeki went further and introduced this concept, and then the committee is created under African Union. Now, if all the African Union countries benefited from the taxation payments, we lose about nearly more than $50 billion and more in Africa tax. And it goes into the trillions in, 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 in the local currencies of the African countries. Now, if that happened, we would not have had a problem to date with countries not having enough hospitals, with countries not having enough clinics, with countries not being able to have those health uh, people to attend to this COVID-19. So the wake up call is making sure that when this committee at the African Union that President Beck is chairing and, and the former uh, African Development Bank CEO, he's part of that committee, he's leading it in, in, in the secretariat, that, that we can then look at the solicit outflow of capital and make sure that the laws, my, my, my experience in building mines in the rest of the African continent is that when I look at the mining laws, or the, the Department of Trade or Commercial Laws or Finance Laws, there are loopholes. There are loopholes in the finance laws that has to do with transfer pricing being able to, to be done, taxation not being paid. There are loopholes also in the laws that says, uh, that doesn't give us the, the right to, to focus on manufacturing locally with the end product that we have. Africa should have been one of the most successful continents and the richest continent we are in terms of our minerals resource and reserves, but we're not rich when it comes to creating the end product. So this wake up call is allowing us to sharpen our wits and sharpen our pens and make sure that when we go beyond that within the African Union, within, uh, within the United Nations and all the other organizations, how we as business and labor and, 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 and political leaders can then integrate our efforts beyond where we find ourselves now. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing us to the question of tax justice, of how much money Africa leaks externally, uh, forget what we leak internally, um, and really that needing to be part of the Build Back Better transformation, um, how we finance social services, social policy. There are a lot of um, commentary uh, questions in the sidebars as I'm waiting for a hand in terms of who might want to intervene. Um, let me just read off some of the questions and any of you can pick up whichever ones um, make sense to you. There's a question on um, why we're not talking about challenges of leadership that relates to a question that was asked about local corruption. There's a question about uh, lack of focus on education and educational institutions, I guess if we're talking about R&D and innovation. Um, a question around herbal medicines, vaccine, 
and what Africa is doing around sort of testing that um, quality assurance uh, questions around that. A question specifically for Kojo around how the South African innovations he talked about can be moved forward to connect continental collaboration. A question on where the Anglophone, Francophone, Lusophone collaboration is on implementation of SDGs on China's role in Africa and how that relates to manufacturing on mental health. Um, a question on where is money for fish pond farming and social impact uh, investment in general development financing. I see Didi answered that in the column. Um, domestic production, electricity, a snarky little comment about how can we manufacture without electricity as I'm sure those in South Africa are all questioning after freezing yesterday. Um, and what is meant by questions of local value chains, shorter value chains. I'm, I'm going to do a round in the same order that I did it before. Just pick up any of those that um, make sense to you or that you feel competent to address. One Kelle, and in the meantime, people who are participants, we're, we've got 177. If you put up your hand, uh, then you should be able to engage. One Kelle. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Wanyeki. Well, let me start with um, you. You reminded me that I didn't uh, answer the uh, the part of the question on innovation uh, in light of COVID nineteen. I think, as others have said on the panel, we are seeing uh, innovation in um, in e health services in Africa, in remote uh, doctor visits in Africa, in digital pharmacies, um, and all of these things have uh, are a result of uh, uh, COVID-19. And I think from our point of view, as a, uh, a secretariat of the African Union uh, for, for Trade, what we have to do is to uh, uh, establish the appropriate regulatory and legal framework for all of this innovation um, to take off. Uh, so as we talk about digitization of trade in Africa, I think this is uh, the context is all of these innovations that we have seen since COVID-19. Now, I think one of the questions that came up is on um, uh, um, China's role in Africa and manufacturing. Uh, China, of course, has been a partner to Africa, a development partner to Africa for a very long time. Um, and, and China has, uh, as a global exporter, as the number one global exporter, has economies of scale uh, in a number of sectors. There are various um, uh, implications for that that we have to consider. But I think that uh, from our point of view as the African continental free trade area and as African Union, we interface with China as a development uh, partner, a very, very strong development partner. We are aware that um, uh, there are areas where we, we have to be cautious um, in manufacturing in particular. Uh, China has uh, advantages over us, has economies of scale. And so in the African continental free trade area itself, in the agreement itself, we have built in safeguards to protect the domestic market in Africa from uh, being uh, uh, dominated by goods that are not produced in the AFCFTA area itself. So we have built into uh, uh, strong safeguards to protect ourselves from uh, dumping, uh, from uh, the importation of subsidized goods, because all of these things lead to, uh, to job losses in Africa. And we do not want the African continental free trade area to lead to job losses. We want it to create jobs. And that is exactly why we have built in these safeguards to protect uh, the domestic market. When I say domestic market, I mean the entire uh, AFCFTA market. And the second thing that is, is related to that is we have very, very strong provisions that, um, that actually are preventing will prevent rather the, the transshipment of goods. So goods, third country goods that should not be benefiting under the AFCFTA preferences will now not be allowed um, to, to, to come in as a, under preferences 
And, and again, because if that happens, if we see transshipment of goods, we will see massive job losses, domestic market distortions in Africa. And that is exactly what, what we do not want to do. Uh, the question on um, uh, 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 manufacturing and industrialization and the electrical grid, of course, those are two uh, uh, challenges that we have to confront. Um, it is difficult to, to have a very clear manufacturing uh, strategic plan over time if the electrical grid um, is uneven. And so we have to work very closely with national governments because this is a national issue. We have to work very closely with the national governments and where there is, and of course, multilateral uh, development finance institutions uh, to see how governments can be across the African continent can be supported to make sure that there is reliability of an electrical grid, which leads to, uh, um, to an uninterrupted uh, productive capacity in, um, in manufacturing. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Kojo, you had a specific question on the innovations that you talked about in collaboration across the continent, but please also pick up any other question that was of interest to you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the, 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 as I mentioned, the beauty about the, the innovations I mentioned, and, and, and there are others we can discuss, is that, as I said, they're scalable across the continent. Um, some of them have been tried in other places and are being tried. They're not, these are not novel things, but, but they need to be scaled. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested, particularly out of South Africa, please get in touch because my colleagues and I are very keen to, to make sure that we can, we, we, we can really infect the rest of the continent with some of these innovations. I'd like to deal with, a, with an issue which always comes up when we speak about Africa, which is the issue of corruption. Having been in banking for, for, for many years and in business for longer, I think we miss, we, we miss a, a much more essential point. Uh, and, and many people who are in business, I, I think, will tell you and who've worked across the world that even more important than the issue of corruption, uh, issues around in ranks. We have that creates a, 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 the space for corruption. As long as we have the competence, in, in especially in terms of CLEAK, we have to develop a patriotic bureau value for what we do. So, corruption is important, but I'm afraid there are things which are even more important than making sure there isn't corruption. It's no use having a non corrupt, incompetent, unpatriotic. Um, on, on patriotic civil service. The, I'd like to also deal with the China issue, and I must declare a little bit of a bias here. Um, I have great grandparents who are Chinese, <laughs> so I get very sensitive when I hear some of the so some of the pushback against China. Thirty years ago, when I was growing up, we had a choice: we either aligned with the Soviet Union or we aligned with America and the West. Today, we can speak to Turkey, we can speak to Indonesia, we can speak to Brazil, we can speak to Russia, we can speak to China. We have more partnerships available, more partnership options. China is just one of them. Provided we are clear as to what our objectives are, what we're looking to get from our interactions, China should just be another item on the menu, another part of the choice. The Chinese are very aggressive and they have all right to be that way. You know, there are nearly two billion of them. They have to find things to do, okay? So I, I think we should see the, the, the presence of China in the world as an opportunity to have one more interlocutor rather than some great big fear that we're going to be overwhelmed. And I'd like to end with something which is very dear to my heart. And, and I've discussed this with um, our co-host, Ayuna, uh, a couple of times. That is the SDGs. For the first time in a long time, we have a set of principles, a set of objectives, which is developing countries we can use to measure where we are, where we are on health, where we are on education. And I really want to encourage the United Nations bureaucracy and the international financial agencies to use these more assertively in terms of allowing or encouraging countries 
to, 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 to measure and publish these in terms of their achievements. You know, why don't we have budgets which say we're spending 5% of our GDP on SDG 1, we're spending 10% of our DG, GDP on, on, on SDG 13. And at the end of the year, we can say, how have we done? And we can have a consistent annual measure and also across territories. There, there are lots of opportunities that the SDG allow us. And now I just want to end quickly. My good friend, um, Busi Samoyo from, from, from Zim is asking about the role of regional value chains. Well, you know, Busisa, you, you're an accomplished industrialist and a business person, and you know that regional value chains are critical, and the more efficient they become, the more efficient and, and productive society becomes. And COVID has shown us that if we don't have strong regional value chains, in fact, national value chains, that makes us very vulnerable and that increases the overall business risk of our activities. So regional value chains need to get a lot more attention. You know, we, we can't simply place all our eggs on the international value chain basket. So yes, and, and really it's up to people like yourself, Basisi, to make sure that these are strengthened. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before I come to you, Didi, Wamkela has to leave us. So I just want to give him a minute to say bye and to thank him for giving us his time on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to the organizers for, for inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry I, I uh, cannot stay for the rest of the session. I, I have a uh, keynote address to give at another session that is, that is starting in a few minutes. But I've enjoyed uh, this discussion and I look forward to a personal and a face-to-face -face interaction with, um, with all of you uh, when, when the conditions allow. So thank you again uh, very much for inviting me and I wish you uh, very good uh, uh, deliberations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And everyone who's asking about continental collaboration, continental supply chains and so on, he's your man. He's in charge of us. He's in charge of making this thing happen. Um, so please feel free to contact him directly afterwards. Uh, Didi, your turn. Anything yes, that hit you? you? So and I can yes. see you've been very busy responding to questions <laughs> on the site. Well, you know, I work in the agriculture and food landscape. And as I said before, Africa is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. There's no reason why we should be importing anything at this point. And Ace Foods has started, uh, thankfully, exporting to South Africa. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more interest in these regional value chains. Um, but it will require a couple of things, which I, I think people have alluded to. It will require that we rethink how we teach agribusiness. Um, agriculture is still being thought as a science across Africa instead of as a business. And I've been advocating for years that every business school should have a mandatory curriculum on agribusiness. And every agriculture school should actually be revamped to focus on agribusiness because while science is important, it's just one piece of the success model uh, required to unlock the entire ecosystem. I sit on the board of Nigerian breweries. And I'm always excited to say Nigerian breweries is Heineken, obviously a multinational in Africa, but because of their commitment to local sourcing, um, they invested in research to use cassava to make beer so that they could stop importing malted barley. That innovation has unlocked the industrial component of cassava processing in Nigeria. And now every other um, brewery across Africa is starting to use cassava, which is much cheaper and definitely uh, more accessible. And even in Nigeria, my team at Sahel Consulting is leading a whole program called Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria to ensure that we can source milk locally. We have the fourth largest cattle herd in Africa, and yet we import about 99% of the processed milk we consume in Nigeria. So what we're doing is basically encouraging local players to source milk locally by training uh, farmers, putting them in clusters, improving the productivity of their cows, and unlocking a whole ecosystem around vet care and feed and fodder and packaging and processing and cold storage. Um, and that needs to be done in every single value chain. Where we can source locally, we should. And that's what shorter value chains are about, looking inwards to say, what can I use to fill gaps? And where I can't find it in my country, can I find it in Ghana? Can I find it in Benin Republic? Can I find it in my region? And if it's not in my region, can I move outside my region? And that's why we need the Africa free trade 
um, to work because the, the barriers to trade have to be reduced, but there is an appetite for Africans to work across the board. Um, so education has to be revamped and it's critical. And so do our research institutions. We have in West Africa over 60 focused research institutions just on different agricultural value chains, but they're not private sector led or private sector driven. And we need to revamp how they work to ensure that every year they're basically coming to the private sector and saying, what are your problems? How can we solve them? And we don't need research for research sake. We need data driven research that translates into new products that are innovative, that are available and affordable for the masses of people to ensure that we can reduce the malnutrition rates in our countries. And one thing that I wanted to talk about, which I think had been sent to me earlier, is very, very critical. We need to raise financing locally. And this gets to the China question, but all the other questions that have been raised around financing. I don't know how many of you saw the Guardian article yesterday, which reinforced a lot of what we know. It says of the top 10 African-based startups that received the highest amount of venture capital in Africa last year, eight were led by foreigners. So only two were led by Africans. And when I looked further at the data, I said only 6% of startups that received more than a million dollars in 2019 were led by locals. So there's a problem with financing in our landscape. Lots of people are coming to Africa and positioning themselves as African entrepreneurs or friends of Africa in Africa and are raising financing for their businesses on the continent. And our startups, our SMEs can't access this financing. And I think it's time for us to take a radical approach which is we have, first we have to call out these inequities and that's a role for media, but we also have to ensure that our companies are investment ready. We have to amplify their successes. We have to equip them with the skills and tools to showcase their work. We have to celebrate them. And at the end of the day, it's up to us to say, we need a level playing field. We demand a level playing field. If you're an investor working in Africa, invest in African businesses. Don't say you're working in Africa and you're investing in European businesses on the continent. And so this type of um, moves push for, you know, the celebration of the, the Lagos Angel Networks and Angel Networks across the continent, but also for funders who are homegrown. And I celebrate the work of the African Philanthropy Forum because I see Africans saying, we wanna take charge of our destiny. We're gonna fund our solutions. We're gonna fund our entrepreneurs and we're gonna collaborate with others to do this. And I think this is a rallying call for all of us to take financing more seriously because we are generating wealth and the few of us who have that should invest back into the continent. Thank you. I think that's so important. I mean, <clears throat> you know, um one of the continental sort of um, solutions was this African uh, common procurement uh, platform that was set up by young IT people with financing from Strive Masiwa that he had gotten from AfriX and Bank, which raises the question of what's happened to all of our supposedly development finance banks. Um, and you've moved the debate forward into what's happening now in the social impact investing world in the, in the wake of Black Lives Matter is our just huge questioning of who are the fund managers? Are there black fund managers? What are they putting their money into and so on? And I think it is time for those kind of debates to also really play out on the continent for the reasons that you've said. I think you've also raised a really interesting question uh, uh, that responds to the question asked in the chat around research uptake. And usually when we're talking about research uptake, we talk about sort of the difficulties of getting policy oriented research taken up by our states. And I think Kojo says that that's one of the opportunities he's seen. Our states are desperate. They need ideas. Um, but you've raised the question of perhaps our think tanks pivoting a bit to sort of think about being solution oriented for local entrepreneurs, for our, the, the problems that they are having that are of a social nature. Food supply chains are a social problem. Um, so that's really interesting. I will come to Bridget now, who of course knows a lot more about this than me for sure. Um, Bridget, any of these questions that really strike you, especially the question of how to get financing uh, and investment for, for these um, sort of startups and innovations? Uh, it's uh, financing is a real challenge because um, you can't do anything unless you have financing. In South Africa, we have the National Economic Fund um, and then national uh, and, and NEF, 
they it's an organization that's a state owned and they fund small and medium enterprises and the very vulnerable business person. And we also have the Industrial Development Corporation that focuses on billions of money dedicated towards funding small and medium enterprises. But we also have laws and regulations that ensures that if you're a mining producer or if you're a producer of any fact a factory producing anything, whether it's bags or you're going to manufacture cars or you're going to own a, a, a factory that manufactures, that produces wines or you own a farm, you cannot do that unless you have a partner. And that partner is a member of the South African historically disadvantaged South Africa. That person that during the previous regime, the previous leadership before 1994 could not get access to any money or any, 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 any rights to own. Now, you as the producer will then bring the, 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 the money and the, the vulnerable, not, or maybe not vulnerable, but the, 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 your entrepreneur or your business partner who has a lot of skills but have always been uh, denied access to finance because we're not allowed to own land. And if you can't own land, you can't have collateral. So you can't have a bank loan from the banks. So no banks were lending money to black people you know, without, without collateral. Now you would then bring the historic producer or the, the, the capitalist who has been there in business will then bring the money and you then embrace the participation of the person who's been the historically disadvantaged South African who will bring the license to trade because without a license to trade as per the black economic empowerment rules and regulations, you cannot own a license. So no one can own a license in South Africa. If you're Anglo-American and you own a mine, you cannot own a license to trade without a partner. And these partners are people according to the law. And that's where you see the legislation uh, uh, creating uh, 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 obligations. And if you don't comply towards the legislation, there are sections in the law that gives you the penalties. Now, one of the major penalty, if you do not have a black partner or, or a South African historically disadvantaged South African, who is a woman, women rights are very in, 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 in endowed in the constitution and in our legislation and, and disabled people, the youth, the, the, also the community, that you can have a community trust and the, it's not the, 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 the chief who owns everything, the community trust, the ben beneficiaries will be the members of the community. Now, like in the mines I own, the members of the community will be the beneficiaries. And in that trust, the trust deed states very clearly, the money that is the dividend that are paid in the trust will be used for rural renewal projects. And this rural renewal project. So did you find that where we are now during the COVID-19 challenges, you have communities that own mines. The communities never had the money to bring the mine, but the community and the broad-based business partners in that environment will then bring the, the, the opportunity for you who have the money, who have the expertise to get the license. If you want a license, you can't get it 100% if you don't have that packaged uh, 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 laws and regulations enshrined in your application. The government will ask you, okay, fine, what, what does your, what ways of, where do you comply with the triple B codes? Where do you comply with the black economic empowerment rules and regulations? Where do you comply? So if you are maybe a farmer and they said, okay, you own a farm and now there you are, you create, you want to go and produce wines for your farm. Who are your partners in the wine manufacturing plant? And then you say, oh, it's in the rural community. The community trust owns maybe 10%. And then there's a black, black broad-based business trust that owns so much percent and all that. The dividends that are paid in those broad-based business trusts will then help you, who was maybe a, 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 a builder and owned a construction company and didn't have money to, to, to create beyond the little school that you can build. But now you want to go and, 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 and get tenders to go and, and, and develop bigger businesses opportunities, you then get the money through the, the dividends. And if you're a taxi driver and you want to leave the taxi and, and get into a, a transport a, a, a giant in terms of buying big, big, big buses and all that, you, the dividends help you. So, you know, that, that's what's helping 
And one thing I see, especially when I go to the other emerging economies, I find that the legislation, I would go into the ministers and say, look, minister, I can't do to you what, what they've done to us. Can we please, because I'm an economic activist, can we please sit and see how we can then learn from each other and share from each other and, and then together make sure that our economy can function. And, and then, then I sit with the ministries. I'm not there just because it's return for investment is for shareholders. No, that's not what's gonna help African continent. We have now um, embraced and we have won our political emancipation, but the economic emancipation of Africa is not in doubt. And if we do not have economic activists, agents of transformation, pioneers of change, you're going to go and pursue the model that we've inherited from the Western world. We can't. The Western world came here. They exploited, extracted, exported, and left ghost towns and vulnerable African continent. And we are saying, fine, let them come in. I sit on the BRICS Business Council, and I'm representing one of the five business leaders that were uh, nominated to represent South Africa and the BRICS Business Council. So when, and we lead now the, 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 the federations of business chambers. So when President Ramaphosa goes to Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa Business Council, President Putin goes, the president of uh, uh, um, uh, Brazil is there, the president of China is there. The Chinese are very organized. They come there with the mandate and a focus. And you can see they don't leave their focus. They're pre-planned and they're organized. And then they sit there. And in the British Business Council, we've got the committees, we've got working groups, we've got the finance working group, that talks about finance. We're even looking at credit rating. Why should we subject our, our continents or our BRICS uh, countries to the credit rating that we foreigners in, in a Western world, they look at you, they grade you and they rate you. And then they decide whether your country is gonna be a country that will be uh, unique for you to go and, and, and for foreigners and, and foreign cap capital to come in, for foreign direct investment to come in, or whether you qualify also to go and integrate. And we say, uh, we need to look at these credit ratings and see these rating agencies, to which extent should we then maybe create a rating agency? I also talk about money. And that's where I talk about uh, we must create a resources bank. Because if you don't have money to dig a hole, you will not have money to create a mine. Then you can then if that and, and, and even then if you don't have money, so I say we've got banks that do uh, give you loans uh, and but, but you don't have a resources bank that's concentrating on just oil, gas and mineral uh, my, uh, 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 investment and, and, and loans. But also I say beyond that, let us also look at the resources bank. These companies that, that comply to section 26 of the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act. And the section 26 says, any person, section 26.3 of, uh, of the act says, of the mining act says, any person who intends to benefit any mineral mined in the Republic, outside the Republic, may only do so after written notice and consultation with the Minister of Mines. And the Minister of Mines, in consultation with the Minister of Trade and Industry, that's section 26.2, in the consultation with the minister in industry may promote such beneficiation of such manufacturing or such creation of the factory subject to such terms and conditions as the minister may determine. Now, the only reason why to date in South Africa, we don't have a Chinese kind of infrastructure or Chinese kind of manufacturing base is because I go to parliament as the president of the mining chamber and I say, look, all the ministers that we've had, many of them do implement the day-to-day -day legislation, but they did not uh, supervise whether the sections are being properly implemented. If we had section 26 implemented, all those companies all over the world that were buying our minerals, iron ore, manganese, chrome, palladium, whatever, they first have to ask for permission from our minister as per the act. Then the ministers can ask them, why are you there in China? And why are you a uh, 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 Mercedes-Benz? Uh, creating, uh, 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 I mean, uh, Mercedes Benzes, when you know that catalytic converters in the engines of the car, the Nissan, Datsun, Mercedes, come from us, from our palladium and our platinum in South Africa. Can't you then come to our special economic zones in the country and make sure that the special economic zones that are tax incentives, 
you can then, then produce the end product as cheaply, even more cheaper, because we can give you the most cheaper if you want to create a company here. So I'm just saying, I went beyond that. And when I say the Africa ACP, because I always get invited to Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, by the Secretary General there to go and talk. Last time I spoke to 72 uh, ministers in, in Togo, two years ago, ACP had a Togo uh, meeting. And then I said, we need to integrate. We need to have a look at which country does what and to which extent are we going to combine our efforts. Why should I have all the cars be, be, be the Mercedes Benz that are being locally assembled here and some of the cars that are being locally manufactured in South Africa, the whole parts being manufactured here? Why don't we look at what country has what? And to the extent that the country has iron ore and manganese and steel, steel uh, 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 mineral then let this still create whatever it is that is needed to, to, to put here and create it maybe in that country. And, 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 and then leather, if the, you know, and you know, so I'd say, I'd, I'd go and talk and say, let us integrate. And I, I'm happy uh, African Union has an African Development uh, uh, Center that we need to look into. And, and, and Kojo Busia and, and, and Sigam, they used to work there and we used to work very closely. But Anna Vera, these are the things that I think one should pursue beyond. Uh, COVID-19, which is now the wake-up call that allows us to see where are we weak and where are our strengths, where are our weaknesses, and how can we embrace the, the, the sustainability of our, of, our, of our economy. Thank you so much. Um, we can see a lot of solutions are actually being proposed in the chat. Um, so more as comments than questions, a big debate on energy um, renewable energy, hydropower at small scale as well as big. Um, and there's also another sort of uh, uh, stream on enclave economies, um, but people also sharing their resources. So the AU procurement platform, um, Didi's uh, Nourishing Africa platform, um, Kojo has shared his own phone number. Um, and we've unfortunately come to the end of our time. And I'm so sorry to the people who did put their hands up. There were four of them and I only just saw them. I was trying to follow the chat. Um, we don't have time. Type them in as people are doing the vote of thanks because we will save the chat. Um, and yes, the person who asked this session is being recorded. Um, Kojo, last sentence for you to inspire everybody who's here and um, help us get to that change mindset about what we're capable of when we put our minds to it. <laughs> but let, 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 me, let me frame it this way. If, if we were sitting here, a global pandemic, which was, which was going to strike the world. Everyone would say Africa would be Everyone would say Africa would be devastated. No, we are not the US. And that must have something emergencies. But we have to recognize that we've been living in a long economic emergency, in a long socioeconomic, in long socioeconomic distress. And if, if we put the same energy in it and, and, and Oh dear, Kojo, you're, you're freezing a bit. Can you turn your video off and see if your goodbye message to everyone would get through just on audio? Try now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Well, um, Mathoni, th thanks a lot. Mathoni, I was saying if we, were, if, if we were sitting here a year ago and someone had said that there would be a global pandemic, everyone would have said that Africa would be devastated. The reality is that we have done relatively well in this, in this conflict, in, 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 this, in, in the COVID crisis. And part of the reason is that we have a particular energy and we have a particular resilience to respond to crises. We responded to Ebola amazingly well and we're responding to COVID well. I think we need to understand that we are also in a very long, and debilitating socioeconomic crisis. And we need to muster the same energy, the same passion and the same patriotism 
to tackle these problems which have been developed and um, bedeviling us? Is it corruption? Is it the, the, the lack of capacity within our governments? And we can do it. You know, we have shown that we have abilities when when challenged, and we have persons around the world in the diaspora who are willing to come and be part of this challenge. We lots of them have been reaching out to us. So, so Mathoni, I'd like to thank everyone who's been on 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 on, on this webinar and say that yes, we can Africa. Thank you so much. Didi, any last uh, one sentence uh, inspiration for everyone online? Thank you. Just building on Kojo's comment, my mantra during this period has been uh, hinged on an Igbo proverb, which says, Mbelede kaja madike, disasters help to sift out the resilient, the resourceful, and the brave. I think as Africans, we're resilient, we're resourceful, and we are brave. And especially to the SME entrepreneurs on this line, this is your period to pivot, to reimagine, to redesign. What COVID-19 has done is really remove the boundaries between our countries, leveraging technology. And this is a time for us to collaborate, to connect, to reimagine together and to rebuild together. We will emerge stronger. Bon courage. Um, Bridget, um, one sentence only. <laughs> we are the Ubuntu yeah, this nation. Is the and Ubuntu in Africa means brotherhood and unity. I am what I am because of you. So together, let us conquer COVID-19. The same way we conquered the political emancipation, let us pursue the economic emancipation beyond COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's such a good message to end on. And with that, I'll hand over to Brian. Um, Commissioner Dr. Solomon Dursa was meant to close us off, but he had to leave. Uh, he's the chair of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Um, so my colleague Brian is going to give us the vote of thanks and take us home. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mzani. Uh, I think that we give you a pom-pom and thank you to the panelists. Uh, Bridget, uh, Nidhi, Kojo, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I've been trying to walk through and Wamkele who left uh, early. Colleagues, allow me also to thank the uh, colleagues from the UNDP who offered us some te technical services. Uh, our Sherpa, Joy, uh, uh, who's in the background. If you, you, you all know Joy from the first session. Uh, she's the shepherd of this series. Um, and thank you so much to the members of the working group, Paul Msembra from WAP, Ambassador Fodesek from S Senegal, Professor Adebayo Lukoshi from International Idea, Jun Yakan of TWOW, Dr. Khabele Matlosa from the African Union Commission, Department of Political Affairs, Michelle Ndiayentab, uh, who is a leading Pan-Africanist, uh, Dr. Solomon Deso, who you heard, who is the head of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Shahina Jivraj, who is with the Henley Business School. Oye Bisiba Batunde, who is with Nigeria Network of NGOs. And uh, Excellency Bins Kawanas, who is the outgoing uh, uh, Special Advisor uh, on Africa, the Secretary General Special Advisor on Africa, and Kojo Paris, who you've heard. Would like to thank the colleagues that helped with the translation and interpretation services. Thank you so much. And we want to thank all of you for participating. So I have just three, three words for you. Number one, be part of this movement that we are building, the Levi uh, movement. It's very simple we're, because we're an informal movement trying to find solutions. You don't need to have a party card. You simply need to have a credible, uh, business that you run or credible set of things that you do on social entrepreneurship and you become part of the movement. Number two, uh, this is the second in a series. So the third is going to focus on all the things that you're asking about. Leadership, corruption, and Africa's uh, political commitment and political will. And we're hoping in that series to bring at least 
one or two presidents along with the rest of you. So spread the message. We do this on a monthly basis, uh, mid to end August. We should announce in the next two weeks when the next one is going to take place. And the last one, keep hope alive. Africa will not be made by photocopying European, Chinese, or American solutions. We are the solution to our own problem. And in keeping hope alive, let's stay connected. A friend of mine likes to say, we are so brilliant as Africans, but when we remain unconnected and uncoordinated, we can become the power station of mediocrity and everyone reaps benefits from who we are, what we are and what we have. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great rest of your Saturday afternoon. Bye-bye.